Welcome back to the show. Now, growth in China's services sector appears to be moderating. HSBC's services PMI gauge dipped to 50.7 in January. That's the lowest level in nearly two and a half years. Economists say the early Lunar New Year holiday may have played a role. Helen Zhu, chief China equity strategist at Goldman Sachs, joins us now. Helen, we keep looking at these data points. We keep saying it's the weakest level we've seen for X number of years, but we know this adjustment's taking place. The market corrected quite sharply this year, but you say we should be buying on dips. Tell us why. That's right. You know, I think, you know, if you look at the China market over the past few years, it's what we would call a fat and flat market. So in other words, there's been significant volatility, up and downward moves of 20, 30 percent. And that's largely been driven, particularly recently, by some of the cyclical moves uh, in the economy. Um, last June, for example, people were very worried about liquidity. And again, that was uh, the culprit in December as well. Um, people have been very worried about the cyclical picture. But looking forward, we think that some some of these uh, recent unfavorable data points may be uh, transitory. The DM external demand picture we think is still reasonably good and is likely to lift exports to make a greater contribution this year. Some of the Lunar New Year seasonality factors will probably fade and we don't think that policymakers are likely to take any extreme drastic measures to uh, push the economy into a hard landing. And moreover, valuations are now very much at the low end of that uh, historical range and we think has downsides. Support. Is better data points going to be enough, though, if we look at the concerns over the trust products, the extent of debt at the local government level? We know that they're trying to deleverage at the same time, allowing the term structure of interest rates to rise. It's a really fine balance, isn't it? Do they have ultimate control of this? Well, you're right. You know, I think um, there's a differentiation between a cyclical, you know, trading opportunity for the market and a multi-year bull market. Uh, we don't necessarily have the makings for the latter yet, but we do think that we're well positioned in terms of a cyclical upturn in the market. Now, resolving some of these issues that you mentioned are very much going to take many, many years of very uh, delicate and focused attention. Uh, policymakers pushing forward on the reforms when they feel like the cyclical picture can support it and gently backing up a little bit or putting things on pause when they feel like the cyclical picture is a bit more fragile. So I think that will be, you know, a gradual process and that's not going to give us a situation where, you know, very macro sensitive sectors like banks can have a huge re-rating for the near term. Uh, but nonetheless, we do think that there are still other types of reforms that can advance even in absence um, of um, uh, a very robust cyclical picture, you know, social safety net related, financial innovation related, SOE reforms, uh, reforms of various industries like the railroads, etc. And those types of reform progress will continue to be catalysts for the latter part of this year as well. Uh, re regarding banks, I mean, we have, we have seen that uh, there's a big fight for, uh, for deposit. I mean, they, uh, either there's a competition for the shadow banking, there's a big, the large internet company like Alibaba, uh, Tcent, uh, uh, Baidu are, are trying to compete to get part of those uh, deposits. Is it? Do you think the trend continuing? Very much so. I think it's uh, effectively interest rate deregulation happening in front of our eyes without official interest rate uh, deregulation on the deposit side. Um, it's still a relatively small percentage of the overall base of deposits in China, but it's certainly becoming a bigger and bigger proportion of the overall flow. Now, this is structurally the direction that policymakers do want to see. But of course, you know, sufficient regulation and safety uh, protections have to be put in place to ensure that the incremental flow doesn't come in in a way that, for example, relies on things like implicit guarantees that may not be there over the medium to longer term. So it's a structural trend, but one that you know, needs to be properly regulated. If we look over in Japan, we expect the prime minister there to continue to strengthen Japan's uh, security posture. Can I ask where? the relationship between China and Japan figures on your risk metrics and whether you could see any kind of trade impact as we push throughout 2014. That's a great question, and I think it's something that people have been watching very closely over the last year, year and a half. You know, in terms of an earnings um, and growth impact, we've actually done some analyses that show that, generally speaking, China and Japan's um, export relationship uh, isn't one of uh, direct head-on competition as much as, you know, um, Japan's uh, relationship with, uh, you know, Korea or Taiwan may be. Um, we think that, overall speaking, the earnings and um, 
growth impacts will probably be relatively limited. But of course, if things with Japan continue to intensify in an unfavorable direction, then there could be more valuation-related impacts um, on both sides. And specific to China equities, for example, you know, sectors like auto or machinery uh, may have more downside exposure. Really interesting. Helen Zhu, Chief China Equity Strategist at Goldman Sachs. Thanks for chatting to us. The ECB has made 